Yeah, so we are here with David Lefevre of the Met Howe Valley Interpretive Center. And he has put together a really beautiful um, visual tour of the center. And then we're gonna have a chance to get to talk to Dave and ask some questions and learn more about uh, the origin and the work that the this really important center is doing. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dave. Um, just ask the participants, I might come and mute you if I hear background noise. And then when it comes to question and answer, you'll have to unmute yourself because I'm not able to do that, so. Okay, I'm well, thank you. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Medhow at Home, for having me here today, wherever here is. I guess here is many different places for all of us. And yet here we are together in the Interpretive Center, uh, which is where I'm sitting. So what I created today was, well, I created over the last month. It was a virtual tour of the Interpretive Center. And I, I did that using my smartphone. Um, and so please bear with me. This is the first time I've ever created a video of this length and in this way. I mean, literally, I've never done this before. Um, I love giving in-person tours. And so trying to figure out how to best do this uh, was a challenge. And so I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy how I did it. I tried to keep it relatively short, so I'm not gonna cover every single thing in the Interpretive Center. I actually did that once and it was very long and I didn't really like how it turned out. So I redid it, shortened it. And um, for the most part, I tried to stabilize the video while I was recording something. So you'll see some shakiness. My hands tend to shake a little bit. Um, and so sometimes I was holding the, the phone but a lot of times I had it propped on a chair. So I hope that's okay. Um, I do believe we have barf bags. Denny, you brought those, right? So if anybody needs a barf bag, uh, Den, just ask Denny, uh, raise your hand. Yeah, I always carry. So there's a barf icon on these somewhere, okay? So I hope it's not that shaky. And then afterwards, uh, we'll welcome, yeah, welcome you to share any thoughts, any questions, uh, that you might have about the Interpretive Center or me. We also do have Bruce Morrison uh, on here who is our board chair. And so Bruce, um, keep your mouth, you know, quiet, please. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, please feel free once we get into questions and answers, if there's something that um, your depth of knowledge can, can speak to, please do so. Okay, well, here we go, I think. Yeah, you just have to. Oh, God. Excuse my dog. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute. Okay, I'm going to push play. Tracy, let me know if you can't hear it. Okay. I can't hear it yet. No, I can't hear it. The Meadow Valley Interpretive Center. There it is. Unlit Kuch Kich. The Meadow Valley we see today has been shaped by millions of years of powerful forces. Take a walk through our exhibits. Explore this region's rich natural history from ancient geology to flora and fauna and the valley's earliest human inhabitants. Discover the wonders of the Meadow. Clouds of the Meadow. The clouds that track overhead in the Meadow Valley are as much a part of this place as the hardest granite spire. Influenced by extremes in elevation and temperature, as well as the complicated combination of marine, alpine, arctic, and desert inflows and weather systems, the variety of local cloud types that can be observed moving over the Meadow Valley are remarkably varied and ever-changing. Emergence of the Meadow, from ocean floor to icy peaks. According to legends of the Meadow Indians, rocks are the oldest of living things. In the rocks all around us, we can find ancient stories of the Meadow, of its Sinpakchin, a traditional Salish word meaning dawn. These shells were alive tens of millions of years ago, during a time when the Medhau lay beneath ocean waters. More recently, during a period known as the Ice Age, the Medhau Valley was buried under a sea of glacial ice 
up to a mile deep. The ice movement carved U-shaped valleys, rounded the hills, and polished the bedrock. Between these periods of oceans and glaciers, the Meadow Valley was squashed sideways, pushed upward, warped downward, eroded and periodically covered over with sediments. The history of the Meadow is colorful and complex, a story of emergence that continues to unfold. Meadow's Ocean Beginnings There were two periods during which the Meadow lay beneath ocean waters. Marine remnants such as ammonite, all its fossils, can be found today in the Meadow Valley. During the age of the dinosaurs, both ocean systems eventually filled in with sediments and became plant-lined river systems. The earliest rocks found in the Meadow were deposited along a volcanic island chain between 160 and 130 million years ago. Called the Nubi Group, these sediments rode along on the doughy mantle like a conveyor belt that descended down a subduction zone under North America, the Okanagan core region. As the islands neared the Okanagan, the ocean sediments accumulated along the coast of North America. Uplift and Downward Warp During this period, a new subduction zone formed. Mountains pushed up west of the Nubi sediments, while the sediments warped downward to create a new deep ocean basin. Approximately 110 million years ago, the Nubi sediments stopped moving. A new subduction zone had formed to the west. Everything between there and the Okanagan rocks was squashed together. Mountains pushed up west of the Nubi sediments and the sediments warped downward to create a new deep ocean basin. By about 95 million years ago, this ocean was entirely filled in with sediments. Plumes and Faults The mountains of granite surrounding the Minnow Valley today formed from the crystallization of giant plumes of magma below the Earth's surface. Two deep cracks formed along each side of the basin sediments separating them from the uplifted crystalline plumes. Today we see mountains of granite surrounding the Meadow Valley. These mountains formed from the slow crystallization of giant plumes of magma or plutons below the Earth's surface. Two deep parallel cracks had formed along each side of the basin sediments, the Pesatan Fault and the Ross Lake Fault Zone. These faults separated the basin sediments from the relatively uplifted crystalline plumes under the mountains. Erosion stripped away surface rocks, exposing the granite cores of the mountains we see today. Glacial Sculpting During the last three million years, ice sheets up to a mile thick have periodically advanced southward to the Meta Valley. As the ice advanced and retreated, it carved U-shaped valleys rounded the hills and polished the bedrock. Following the natural sculpting process, the shape of the Meadow Valley looked much like it does today. The last glacial cycle, beginning approximately 25,000 to 18,000 years ago, created alpine glaciers that carved U-shaped valleys in all of the Meadow Valley's high mountains. A few thousand years later, an ice sheet covered the entire valley except for the highest peaks rounding the hills and polishing the bedrock. As the glaciers melted, huge volumes of meltwater funneled through the canyons, leaving boulder fields and remnant glacial drift and outwashed sediments in the valleys. During the Ice Age, the Cordilleran ice sheet covered more than half of Alaska and all of British Columbia. Only the highest peaks were visible above a field of ice that extended down into Washington, Idaho, and Montana. The largest lobe of this glacier, west of the North Cascades, covered Puget Sound. The Okanagan lobe, the second largest, buried the Okanagan and Meadow Valleys under ice approaching 5,000 feet thick. Nearly every feature of the valley we see today was modified over the millennia by the erosive forces of this massive continental ice sheet. The geologic story of the Meadow Valley its ancient stories, or Sinpakchi, can be told in the rocks beneath your feet, 
as you walk along your favorite river section or hike your favorite trail or those found here in the Meadow Valley Interpretive Center. One such story is that of the Twist Winthrop Boulder. This unusual boulder was found by a local resident just below the confluence of the Meadow and Twisp rivers. After being used for a doorstop for a few years, it was brought to the Interpretive Center. We wondered what it was and where it came from. Some thought it was so heavy, 20.6 pounds, and slightly magnetic that it might be a meteorite. The boulder took a trip to the University of Washington, where two specialists drilled a small rock core from the bottom of the rock and prepared a very thin slice for examination. The rock was found to be a metagabro, and it contained small amounts of magnetite, which account for the rock's magnetic characteristics. Rocks that have been transported great distances by long vanished glaciers are scattered on the hillsides of the Meadow Valley and are called glacial erratics. Some of the characteristics of this boulder indicate that it probably isn't from a local source, which means that it may be an erratic brought from Canada by the Cordilleran ice sheet at the end of the ice age, perhaps 18,000 years ago. If this boulder could speak, it would tell an amazing tale. Curious about the earth deep beneath your feet? Dig down a bit and discover the amazing story in the sedimentary rocks from a time when the plants and dinosaurs lived. The Meadow Valley has the most diverse record of preserved botanical plant fossils in the West, with 145 different species spanning 100 million years of time. Fossils, ancient storytellers. From ancient ocean floor to long, dry riverbeds, fields, forests, and rugged mountains, fossils offer us a picture book of stories, a real-time glimpse into the past. Could the Meadow Valley have looked like this 100 million years ago? Spectacular fossil beds near Mazama once grew in a rich mix of ferns, palm-like cycads, and broadleaf flowering plants, suggesting that the area might have supported subtropical rainforests. Ribbon of Life It tet. Water gives us life. Everyone lives in a watershed. All areas of land eventually drain water into a lake, river, or ocean. Watersheds provide important habitat for many plants and animals. The Meadow River's watershed's many different habitats include rivers, lakes, wetlands, forests, even alpine tundra. The wetlands of the Meadow River are a hidden treasure. Amid the high peaks, deep forests, in cold streams of the Meadow watershed, wetlands such as marshes and ponds are tucked away, providing critical habitat for many organisms. Wetlands store water and sediment. Over time, they will spring forth a forest or a meadow. Some of the most outstanding wetlands in the Meadow are nestled along the Meadow River or adjacent to lowland lakes. What makes the Meadow River such a healthy place for so many fish? Let's meet some of its inhabitants and find out. Bull trout require cold, clean water to survive because they are sensitive. Their very presence illustrates the Meadow River's good water quality. Pacific lamprey. During its life cycle, this anadromous fish requires a variety of substrates found in the Meadow watershed, from sand and silt to coarser gravels, cobbles, and boulders. Bridge lip sucker. Preferred by this fish, the Meadow watershed's smaller rivers provide both the pools favored in the daytime and the shallower runs sought during the night. The mottled sculpin. Meadow River's swifter water sections provide cold, clean, oxygenated water as well as coarse gravels and cobbles preferred by the sculpin. 
long-nosed dace. This fish favors the coarse gravel and cobble substrate in the shallower runs of the Medha River, as well as its cold, clean, well-oxygenated water. The Red Band Trout The Medha River provides a variety of habitats suitable for the Red Band Trout, although adults prefer its larger, more turbulent sections and rocky substrate. The Mountain Whitefish Primarily bottom feeders, these fish may migrate seasonally and can adapt to a variety of stream habitats while favoring deeper pools and runs. And the Chinook Salmon. The Meadow River's healthy riparian vegetation provides shade, helping to maintain cool water temperatures necessary for Chinook Salmon to thrive. We honor water because it sustains life in the Medhau dialect or in Sochi of the Salish language. A living landscape. The Medhau Valley is rich with life. From the rocks and soil beneath your feet to the tops of the trees and from the valley floor to the highest mountains, this region is home to a wide variety of fauna and flora. This diversity challenges us to be thoughtful stewards of the plants and animals that share this space with us. Flora, some culturally important plants native to the Medha Valley. In the upper left, Western Spring Beauty, or Squinquinium, found at mid to high elevations in open, moist, grassy slopes, among deciduous shrubs or in areas of late snowbeds. They are dug in spring just after flowering. The leaves are a source of vitamin C and A. The corms taste like potatoes when cooked and are an important source of carbohydrates. Each plant has a tiny tuber below ground that is edible raw or cooked. Flowers and leaves are also edible raw. Lower center, bitterroot, spitlum, formerly found along both sides of the Medhau River between Twisp and Winthrop. Flowers only open in the sun Roots are edible and are dug with a digging stick after the leaves have appeared, but before flowers develop. Otherwise, the roots become bitter. Roots are peeled and cooked or dried for winter use. It was considered a valuable plant historically and figured prominently in trade. Lewis and Clark reported that the prepared root was still too bitter, and hence it was called bitter root. Upper right, balsam root. Miktu. Sunflowers abundant in the Meta Valley cover sunlit hills. All parts are edible, fruits, stock, and seeds. Women would beat seeds, or miktu, into birch bark baskets tied at the waist. Dried seeds might be kept for years and then pounded into flour, mixed with deer grease or dried service berry as a treat. Smaller roots are beaten and peeled and then steamed or baked. Young shoots and bud stems are edible in early spring. Lower right, service berry, shia. Widespread and common in the Medha Valley at low to mid elevations. It provides winter browse for many hoofed animals and many bird species eat the berries in August. Berries are eaten fresh or dried in cakes or like raisins for storage. The dried berries in the past were a common trading item. Medhau seasonal food cycle, following the stars, following the seasons. Did you know that the Medhau region's earliest humans followed the stars, the Big Dipper in particular, in their search for food? As it moved seasonally through the sky, this familiar constellation helped to guide the Medhau Indians toward the plants whose roots, leaves, fruits, and seeds were ready to gather. The seasonal movement of the stars also provided integral guidance for hunting and fishing. This constellation, the Big Dipper, is known as Klaunasket, Grizzly Bear in the Sky. Following the Seasons, Utili Taimantwa Gore, Spring. February is the time of Buttercup. We know spring is coming and need to make last minute repairs to be ready. March is when the sunflowers appear. The shoots and bulbs are eaten raw. 
After blooming, the seeds were gathered and put into a pounder, which was then made into a powder. This we called miktu. This was used to flavor food, and if eaten alone, you had to sit very still, or one would choke on this very fine dust. March is also known for when the leaves start to bloom on the trees. Starting with months of March through April after a long and sometimes very hard winter, the Indians hunted for bear just coming out of hibernation. This was the time the bear was said to be in pretty good shape. This would be only overnight trips. They usually did not need overnight trips for brown and black bear. The bear was trapped with the deadfall traps. The last part of April, they trapped for suckers, lamprey, that were running at the time. This was located just below Oroville at the falls in the canyon. Families would gather and work traps. The traps were worked for about two to three weeks, getting enough to last them until the salmon started running in the month of June. Steelhead trout was caught in the sand poil near Keller, Washington. And from there, the Indians traveled to Kettle Falls for the salmon camps. These camps were run by salmon chiefs, who were the ones who kept the peace. By April and May, the families who were left at the winter homes would then leave for the Bitterroot country. Some would go to the Camas lands and dig for their root supply. These are the most popular roots dug in the prairies. One could also hunt marmots there. Summer. June through July, they continued digging for Camas in the Camas lands. Many went to the Wenatchee Valley. They watched for the white blossoms of the Camas plant and also watched for the blue flowers of Itwa, or the dark Camas. Other plants were wild carrots, wild potatoes, wild onion, tiger lily, cattail, wild celery, and pine nuts. Some berries that ripened early were gathered. Service berry was the main berry. The early berries were gathered and dried and sometimes pounded for flavor for other foods. My mother said that two kinds of blackberries were picked late in the summer. They picked wild raspberries, black raspberries, thimbleberries, elderberries, wild strawberries, wild loganberries, wild currants, rose hips, yellow coyote berries, thorn berries, foam berries, our Indian ice cream, choke cherries, and huckleberries. These foods were available during the months of June through October. All foods were taken back to their camps and processed. They also hunted for animals such as deer, bear, and rabbit. The largest season for the different bands, the Wenatchee, Chelan, Enya, Okanagan, Medhow, and other bands east of us, was the running of the salmon. This also occurred during the months of June through October. All summer camps were located around the fishing places in the rivers where the salmon ran. July through August was the fall time, gathering time for all Indians to give thanks to the Creator for all they had and had taken from Mother Earth. Fall hunting season. October through November is the final cycle as far as preparing food supplies. The repairs are being done to their pit homes and other lodges, getting them ready for the winter months. They usually had five camp sites picked out and the families wintered together. They moved to the next camp and the firewood ran out, or maybe the hunting gets poor at one location, so they moved to the next one. In October came the big hunting season for deer and goats and sheep. Meat was brought back to the camps, the game, the women prepared it and dried all the game. The women would do the last of the digging or gathering of moss. They collected cedar for making more baskets or repairing the damaged ones. This was done while waiting for the hunters to return from hunting trips. Skilled hunters, armed with double curved or flat bows made of various types of wood, would hunt for game. They hunted bear, goat, deer, elk, geese, ducks, grouse, and sage hens, rabbit, beaver, cougar, marmot, squirrel, mink, marten, weasels, and fawns. The skins were prepared by the women. Some traveled to distant lands to take in the buffalo hunts, but not all would go. From the hides of the deer, elk, or other large animals, the clothing and covers were made. Robes from the buffalo they got from buffalo hunts or trade. Winter season. By November, the people started settling into the areas where their winter homes were going to be located. Winter homes were made several ways. Pit homes were circular and dug into the ground, covered with tule mats and dirt placed over poles. Tule longhouses usually housed several families. In the winter, families stayed together. If supplies were not plentiful, the men would hunt in the winter for deer and other animals to help get them through the winter. The salmon was the most popular food and was dried and stored for the winter. 
He was only kept one year, any longer, and the salmon would get wormy. Berries that were dried for winter supply were boiled when they were needed for consumption and were mixed with other foods to sweeten for taste. All berries were dried. Hides from animals were tanned and put to use for clothing or other uses such as bags, covers. Smaller animal hides were tanned and used for hats or other items. It was during the winter months that all repairs were done to the baskets and sewing for all the clothing. The men made all their supplies for the next year. They made new spears and bows, other things they needed to get food. They made their nets made of hemp. Each family had their regular places to stay and went there each year. Some of the materials and tools for hunting and gathering and cooking included Indian hemp rope twine for making fishing nets. Antler or wooden digging sticks for digging bitterroot and camas. Stone pounders for making flour from miktu, sunflower seeds. Twined cooking baskets. Water and hot rocks help to cook vegetables, roots, and dried meat. Bows and arrows for hunting game, both small and large. Indian hemp nets were held to the bottom of the water with stones or fishing weights. Knives and arrow points, spearheads, could be napped or made from precious stones like obsidian. Salmon were speared from horseback and captured in weirs set across the river. Salmon Season by Tilly Timon Twagor. During the salmon season, Indian people gathered by the hundreds on the Wenatchee Flats. My father called this the Four Corners. All hands would gather for council and later to play and visit. Some marriages were formed here. They had horse races, and they would gamble. Horse races ran almost hourly on a straight stretch measured up to one mile long. Winners would collect the wager consisting of personal belongings and treasures. They would pile blankets, furs, saddles, knives, traps, and tobacco. Some would even bet their horses. Buffalo robes and rifles were offered until the pile reached the height of about six feet high and about 20 to 30 feet wide at the bottom. Stick games would start and run for days at a time. Seasons of the People by Tilly Time and Tuan Gore. Native people were nomadic and traveled following their food sources, gathering food and preparing it for the winter months. They had use for everything. Waste was not known to native people. Each item from the plants or animals had a purpose for their survival. Our people did things in a cycle throughout the year. There was a particular thing that needed to be done at a particular time. If you did not follow this cycle, you would not survive the harsh winters and may perish for not being prepared. January is the time of north wind, the time to repair and make new supplies for the following year. The children had this time for their in-depth schooling. This was the only time these stories and legends were told. Elders would say you did not talk about the spirits when they were awake. Only when they were asleep could you talk about them. Each year as the north wind blows, the children sat around the fires with their grandmothers and grandfathers. They listened to stories and legends told by the elders, for they were our teachers, our history book, since nothing was written. The elders had a way of teaching the young and holding their attention, knowing their attention span was very short at that age. For one example, they would hear the legend of Yellow Bell, how she did not heed the warning of Lily and Violet and all the others about getting prepared for spring. Yellow Bell was lazy and did not prepare her things so she would look beautiful when the Chinook winds came and Old Man Winter was gone for the year. They tell this is why you see the Yellow Bell with her head hanging and her color is very faded and dull. These stories or legends were told by all bands and were similar in every way. 
How the Land Was Lost, from an interview with E. Richard Hart, author of Lost Homeland, the Medha Tribe and the Columbia Reservation. In 1879, members of the Medha Tribe lost their traditional territory, home to the Medha and their ancestors for thousands of years, through a transfer of land to the U.S. government that was negotiated without their consent. When Europeans first arrived in the region, the Medha lived along the Columbia and Okanagan rivers and in the Medha Valley, a bounteous breadbasket of traditional foods. In 1879, a presidential order established a reservation that fully encompassed the ancient territory of several tribes, including the Medha, but did not acknowledge the Medha's presence there. The Medha were left out of the process that determined their future. Creation of the Columbia or Moses Reservation was supported by Chief Moses of the Sinca Use Columbia tribe, who claimed to speak for the Medha and other affected tribes, but the Medha people were never consulted. Six years after it was created, the Columbia Reservation was opened to non-Indian settlement, and the Medha people were given two choices. Take allotments of 640 acres within their territory, or move to the Colville Reservation. The military was charged with telling all the Indians what their options were, but the military came to the Medha at a time of year when most of the people were higher up in the valley collecting berries and roots. As a result, most never knew of the opportunity to get allotments, and only a few Medha live on those allotments today. In 1886, when the reservation was opened to white settlement, most Medha were simply moved to the reservation and lost everything they had there. The Medha Tribe, Then and Now Our mother tells us stories where she went to the Medha with their families when she was at the age of 12. They traveled by horse and horse and buggy. She sometimes met with her grandfather in his canoe to spear salmon in the Columbia, then returning up the Medha River back to camp. Mother told many stories about her experiences and was happy to share with anyone that wanted to learn. This was her gift, the ability to share what she knew so not to let things be forgotten and die out. She had seen too many take what they knew because of the epidemics, leaving no apprentice to carry on his or her trade. She made sure everything she knew she taught her children and to anyone, really, who wanted to learn. When soldiers drove the people out of the Medha Valley, it was a horrible time in that century. Some were still cooking their meals on the fires when they were moved in front of the soldiers that were sent in there. Mothers' families were moved to the Chilowist on the west side of the Okanagan River. They refused to cross the river to the reservation, so were homesteaded in that area. Since none of them could read or write, they did not understand the wording for the homestead. Thus, they lost their land again. These bitter feelings stayed with our mother and she carried them to her grave. Her stories still live on because she was willing to share and keep the stories alive because her people did exist and the descendants still are living today. Thank you for being a part of this virtual tour of the Medha Valley Interpretive Center. We covered a lot of ground in a large span of time. Hope that you feel even more deeply connected to this place, to its first inhabitants, and to all those who call this place home. Kunlit Kuchkich in white. Thank you for coming on a little tour with me, the Interpretive Center. Wow. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm like a little emotional. I encourage everyone to unmute yourselves. And um, boy, I learned a lot that I, I thought that I knew quite a bit, but I learned so much there. Anybody want to share something uh, that you just... One thing you learned that surprised you in the interpretive center tour. 
was the sunflower seed the main source of flour? Yeah, as far as I know, there really aren't, you know, we are not an oak country like many mm -hmm. tribes further to the south. Um, and so there's not a lot of other sources for flour here. I think the nice thing about the sunflower seeds of Miktu is that they, they, they can be stored for a long time. I mean, once you pound them, they go rancid quicker, mm -hmm. um, but you can store them for a long time. And so that was, uh, that was a really good thing. I don't know what it tastes like. So it might've been a treat too, but I think they were mostly mixing it with fat and, um, and pounded service berry or other berries. Um, but one of the stories in, I think, you know, a lot of the stories I shared are from Tilly Taimantua Gore, so sister of Elaine and Jimmy, and, um, and sharing stories that their mother told them. Um, but one of the stories about how they would actually consume it dry, powdered, and you had to be real careful, <laughs> otherwise you would choke um, on it. <laughs> It is sit very still if you were a kid to do that. So I don't know if that was enjoyable or if it was a challenge for them, maybe both. Oh, Denny, you're muted. You're muted, Denny. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Dave, you got me a little confused at the end. Was your mother Indian, you say? No. No, no. So the stories I was sharing first person all come from uh, the Taimantua family. And oh, okay. Elaine and Jimmy Taimantua and Tilly are the, <clears throat> the current generation that we have relationships with. And they were sharing stories from their mother. Okay, mainly. right, right, right. You know, and, and the importance is telling those in first person, like, I can't give a synopsis of those stories. I can't give it in my own words. I need to just read them if I'm going to share them. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what I did. And, and I think that it's more powerful that way, too, because they are their words and, and they are offering them to us. Yeah, good. I remember when that amazing black rock was brought in and I really appreciated your featuring that. It yeah, wasn't that rough. long ago. And then they had to take it away to get it examined because nobody could figure it out. It's rock. Oh, it is so heavy. Oh. Yeah. And there's the <laughs> hole in the bottom, I guess. Hmm. Oh, it is a heavy rock. Yeah, um, it was interesting. You know, I, I guess I didn't realize about the geology. I'm going I'm going back a little farther that Tiffany was really the, at the edge of the continent the whole time. And and it does feel really different mm -hmm. over there, you know, so I thought that was yeah. really interesting. Yeah, and it wasn't I, I will admit it was a challenge. It's a challenge for me to to present the geology part um, well, it's because complex. it's complex and it's, it was very challenging for us to interpret it. So Bruce and I were just talking about that. We took this immensely big history and tried to create meaningful interpretation panels. And then whenever I have a tour or doing this, then I'm taking the panels and trying to interpret them further. And it is a challenge. And so um, one of the things, yeah, that I didn't, because I was trying not to have the camera moving a whole lot. So I didn't present everything even on our displays. Um, but it, it does talk a little bit about the Okanagan range and how different it is. And, and Tiffany and kind of East being right. the Okanagan range mm -hmm. more or less. But yeah, I mean, the, you know, it's like I blasted through 
160 million years of geologic history <laughs> um, in uh, gosh knows how long, five minutes or something. I'm sorry, it's mind boggling. But I think, you know, the big story is that, um, that the Metha Valley itself is, is sedimentary or volcanics that have become sedimentary, maybe even more metamorphosed a bit. But basically that's a sedimentary basin that was an ocean basin a couple of different times. Um, it got filled in and then dropped again. And, and then these faults along the edges of it, the Ross Lake Fault and the Satan Fault lifting up, right? And so I think the Meadow Valley has been described as a grobin, so a grave, so dropping down. Up. And then, um, and then, right, so where did these, if it's sedimentary, where do we have these great volcanic or granite peaks from? Oh, well, that was uplift, you know, so there's uplift and then what we say is downward warp happening all at the same time. And we're talking, you know, this happened over such a long time span. Um, and so that history, you know, and so how do we know some of that? Well, we know some of that from the fossils. And it's, I think it's amazing to me um, that, yeah, we have a, 145 different plant fossils spanning 100 million years that have been found in the Metha Valley. Uh, and so that helps us to tell this story. And some of those fossils I showed very briefly are those stories that, that are being told, which is that this place at some point was subtropical, cycads and ferns and all that. I mean, that was before there were, um, it was probably even before there were things like conifer trees or at the very beginning of conifers, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, which I wish I had emphasized, is the lamprey, the Pacific lamprey as a species evolved somewhere around 450 million years ago. So the Medhau, that's 200, 300 million, 300 million years before the Medhau even began to exist. Lamprey have been on this planet and they're still coming up our rivers. And then to connect that with the stories of the seasons and where the lamprey were a very important source of food to basically hold off, you know, the people have run out of salmon in winter or spring, but then the next run of salmon aren't gonna start coming in until June. But, you know, thank creator for the lamprey. So man, the lamprey, which then has been around for 450 million years. That's just such an amazing story. Um, to me, I, I love that, uh, that species. Survivor. Um, and one of the other things I realized in the video, I was, I spoke quiet. So when I first recorded the videos, I was speaking loud and it echoed in here, which didn't sound great. So I tried to quiet my voice, but I, I'm sorry, it was a little too quiet at times. And one of those was in the beginning where mm -hmm. I introduced um, this. So I'll read it again, just because I think this sets the stage for the, the deep connection with Metu culture and geology. So according to legends of the Metau Indians, rocks are the oldest of living things, right? Rocks are living things. In the rocks all around us, we can find ancient stories of the Metau, of its Sinpakchi, which is a traditional Salish word meaning dawn. So these, these ancient stories that we're presenting, and I want to emphasize this, that we're presenting these not just because we love geology, which we do, Bruce in particular, he comes from two geologists. We love geology, and it's such a great story, and it gives us some perspective, but also because it is so important for the telling of Methow culture, and that's what this place is really about. The reason we, we do that, we, we have flora, fauna, the reason over, over the years we've had programs on mushrooms to fires to uh, wolves and all that is in part because the Medhau people, as we were talking about at the very beginning, Tracy, they, their culture and their lives across time and space are so embedded in this land and this place and these waters that you can't tell their story without telling this story, you know, starting with the Sinpakchin, the very dawn, right? 
the beginning, which is beginningless, but we say it's a beginning. So that's, you know, just to give the, the context, that's, that's really where this place uh, came about and why, why we tell all these stories. We love wolves too. We love wildlife. We love it all. And we want to tell that story too of natural history, but also because you can't tell the story of the, the original and still existing inhabitants of this place without telling that. Well, that's so beautiful, Dave. Thanks for articulating uh, that connection. And yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit about the origin of the Interpretive Center and just a yeah, quick, because so, we are coming down to our time. I know we got a little bit of a late start, but. Uh, so I'll try to keep it short. Yeah, it, the Interpretive Center um, as an organization and as a physical building have come, came out of uh, a reconciliation process between some of the white inhabitants of this valley, Glenn and Carolyn Schmeckel and others, and the first peoples of this place. And they started off just with that question of like, we call it the Medhow. And these are, this is my words, this is not Glenn's words or Carolyn's words. We call it the Medhow. Who are the Medhow? Where are the Medhow? Are there any Medhow? What happened here? And at that time, which we're talking almost two decades ago, that was a very important question, just that question coming up. Oh, okay. And so, then the search began and, oh, there are Menhau people, there are descendants and what happened? Why aren't they here? And so the bringing together of Menhau descendants and white settlers, colonizers, whatever you wanna call us, newcomers, um, started, you know, started down a road that we're still on. And that's a road of reckoning with what has happened in the past, acknowledging it, honoring it, including you know, some of the, the stuff I brought up today with how was this home, that whole book that Richard Hart and all that historical research he did. Um, how was it lost? Why was it lost? What are the repercussions of that? What's going on today? Um, and, and so though that beginning in reconciling relationship is still ongoing at the core of our work. So fast forward a bit, it resulted in the Twist River powwows. And those were really important times to come together to build relationships and to honor each other. Um, and it, a lot of this is in this film called Two Rivers, which chronicles that process and what happened then. Um, and I'll, I would love to do a screening of this through Medhow at Home. I need to figure out the rights and regulations for this because we don't own the rights to screen it, but I think we could figure out a way to do it. Um, and I think that would be really wonderful. Maybe some of you have seen it, maybe you haven't. So this kind of chronicles that early story. <clears throat> and at the end of this, there's sort of four agreements that are made. And those are from you know us to the Medhow descendants. And what we said was that we, we wouldn't let people forget that the history and that met how descendants are alive today. So that's the first one. That's it. That's the center in huge part. That's why we do this. So we, we won't, we won't forget. Um, another one is to, to work on education in the schools and curricula around native American culture, life ways, history. And so that's a lot of my work as well. Three is to, have um, to try to foster and cultivate access to traditional gathering places in the valley. So that's gathering for Western red cedar, tule, bitterroot, Indian potato, on and on and on and on. And so we do that. We do that with a lot of other nonprofits in the valley with state and federal agencies and private landowners. And the Meadow Conservancy is, is doing a lot of good work there. And then lastly is to come together annually and have some sort of gathering. So the powwows were those for a lot of years. Those are hard to keep going. It takes a lot of effort. The fires that happened here in 2014 and 2015 kind of stopped that. Don't know if we'll ever do it again, but we continue to have these gatherings. We have first root ceremonies. We have first salmon ceremonies. We've done films on the Miller families, the Miller family, 
a couple of years ago and had that. So uh, Homestream Park was another example. So those, you know, those are the four agreements sort of that we made. I don't mean sort of, we made. And given the history of how many times Native Americans have been told one thing and then that was taken back, told another thing, oh no, that was taken back. It's really important for us to keep these agreements. And so I would say that's kind of at the core of our ethics as an organization. Those are our values as an organization. We don't always put that front and center, but it's the deep bedrock of why we do the work that we do, why Bruce is a board member, why he puts so much effort into this. Um, and, you know, and then the beauty is that because we have those relationships, because we have developed them and we are continually taking care of them, honoring our elders and our tribal relationships, we can respond to things like the fires that happened over Labor Day weekend. We can respond very quickly because we have the relationships, because we can figure out what the needs are and because there's trust. So that's a really important connection to make to you know, this day and age that we, we started that work, we're continuing that work, we will never stop this work. And it allows us to honor them through saying, hey, we wanna help. And they will accept that because there's trust. And so it's really sweet to see the fruits of all this work coming up. And I definitely wanna thank our community here for providing the support too, and trusting us as an organization to do this and to do it right. David, do I remember that there was an arrangement between you, the organization and the tribes where the lease on your area and the museum is in their name and if they do the presentation in the one room that features their life, yeah, you're, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. The Colville Confederated Tribes or the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. So the actual tribal reservation and it's a confederation, so it's not a, a nation and that's a history that <laughs> I always have to ask Richard Hart what that all means. But the Colville Tribes, I'll say, we do have a relationship with them. They help pay part of the rent and utilities here and they have office space here. So that is in part why the Colville Confederated Tribal flag flies above the Interpretive Center. And that is a very important relationship as well. So yeah, so we're, we're, we're cultivating that relationship sort of organization to <laughs> confederation. And at the same time, we're cultivating relationships with the Medhaw descendants. I will say that the Medhaw descendants in general, don't necessarily trust that government very deeply. <laughs> um, they have never been a big or a powerful tribe. So we, yeah, so we have to, we have to cultivate both, you know, in, in a respectful and honorable way. And I think so far we've, we've been able to do that. But there, yeah, you're right. Thank you, Val. They're a very important partner with us. Do you guys receive much support governmental support at all for your work from the u.s government um well we receive i guess a tax exempt status which is important from the state of washington you know as a nonprofit. um and grant i guess grants is the other place where we receive support um and you know, some of those are private grants and some of those are grants that come to through, I would say this, the federal government as well. So, yeah, I, yeah, nothing, it's, nothing more, more than that. Right. It's just so critical right now, this work that you're doing, this healing work that you're doing, I think for us to move forward as a nation, you know, to address this huge wound, um, of settlement and colonial domination, whatever you want to call it, however you want to see it. Um, it's such big work. And I just, I just want to just bow down and honor you, Bruce. I know you've been involved with this for a really long time. David, what a blessing to have you 
come, you know, have somebody with your breadth of experience and dive in um, into this work. And yeah, yeah I just really that. want to see it be like front and center in our valley. You know, I think I think this is just so, so crucially important as we move forward to acknowledge what has been and where we're at now and how do we move forward and integrate and heal. So yeah, Bruce. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think one thing that we've learned from our, our elders and our friends in the Medha tribe is that things ripen at the right time. And I think one of the things that we, we, you know, white folk for lack of a better word, and I know that's a broad brushstroke, but we're so impatient. I'm impatient, right? I, I want, I want this to happen now. I want it, this, it's good work. I want it to fruit, fruit now, ripen now. And, um, things ripen when they're meant to. And so I think that's a story that the Interpretive Center is able to tell also that it's been a lot of deep, quiet, slow work. And if we didn't build the relationships and do it in the right way, we wouldn't be here the way we are today. And, uh, and so I think there is a recognition that I'm feeling in our communities of the Interpretive Center um, being at the forefront of this. And, but we couldn't have done it without all the relationships that we continue to take care of. And that, that really remains a center piece to us. You know, you can have goals and objectives and, and a lot of, you have to have those as well, but they cannot come at the cost of the relationship. That is first and foremost to us. Is it open now at all, Bruce? Is the interpretive center open? Um, it's not open to the public any, uh, regrettably, you know, we can't do that during COVID. Um, and so that's why this opportunity, thank you, Tracy and Met Out Home for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to host a visual tour because we've invested a huge amount of time and specifically Carolyn Schmeckel and Susan Sprague, you know, with, with other partners uh, in getting the center, uh, we use this time where we couldn't host people publicly to, to really um, deck out the, uh, the center with uh, displays like that had, had depth and uh, subtlety and, and, uh, and visual impact like it's never been before. So, you know, we're, we're more than eager for the opportunity for folks to come back in. And this is a, a, a teaser, you know. It probably Thank won't you. be open at all until after the COVID is pretty well died off. And, and yes, until until it's safe. Yeah. Yeah. We. I mean, we started. We were just about to open in a small way, kind of towards the end of summer. Right. In the fall, doing private tours, maybe doing some small group tours, and then with the with the increases in COVID rates this winter, just had to cancel all those. I have done a few school field trips. So using it as an extension of the public school, following all the protocols of the public school. And that's been really rewarding. Yeah. Uh, and the feedback's been really positive. So important. Op open to some of that in a cautious way right now. But, uh, but we've been trying to really improve our online presence. So the notes from the center that I've done, you know, if you're interested in any of the plants that I talked about, bit of root and balsam root and service berry. I do have episodes, short five minute episodes mm -hmm. just on those plants. So please check those out. Um, maybe Tracy, I can send you the links for those and you can share them. Yeah. 